Gracious God, thank you once more for the opportunity to hear your word. And that's exactly what I pray, that you hear, that these folks hear not my words, but your words. That they see not me, but you would work through me. So Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our gracious rock and redeemer. Amen. If you had a chance to see Wednesday Wondering this week, I was trying to give you a short course in photography. Now, most of the time when you take your automatic cameras and you take a picture of something, basically it means that everything's going to be in focus. So if somebody's here and somebody's here and somebody else is up here, when you take the picture, they're all going to be in focus. But when we use some of those fancy dancy cameras sometimes, between the settings on the camera and the lens that we're using, it gives us the opportunity to be able to change things around a bit. So that might mean that we have what we call a very, very narrow depth of field, which means that a person standing here may be in focus, but all these people may be out of focus. Or if I turn the lens a little bit, this person may be in focus, that person's out of focus, and this person's out of focus. I'm ready for lunch. <laughs> But you see what I mean. And the reality is, is that oftentimes we see what we want to see. And I think that's a really good example of how we can do that. All i got to do is twist the focus on the lens of the camera a little bit. And I can determine whether I want to see them or them or them. And that's the way we live a lot of our lives, I'm convinced. We see what we want to see, not necessarily what we need to see oftentimes. And this is a perfect example of that this morning. A perfect example when we hear the story of Jesus coming into town. These folks who were doing all the cheering and the yelling and all of that, they saw what they wanted to see. And what they really wanted to see was this conquering hero coming into town. Because this was a reenactment for them, those who wanted to see what they wanted to see that morning, this was a reenactment for them of a conquering hero that had come into Jerusalem years before and it helped throw off the people that were oppressing them and they had the same kind of celebration. So here they are now thinking once more, here he is, here he is, wow, this is great, this is fantastic. And yet they saw what they wanted to see instead of what they needed to see. And what they needed to see was a different Messiah. What they needed to see was the Messiah that God gave them. And this was the Messiah that hadn't come to throw off the conquering Romans, but instead had come to save us from something so much more important and critical, and that is simply our sin. This Messiah had come to save us from our sin. Now, I can say that today, and people are just kind of like, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Say it again. Say it again, preacher. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, right. Ditto. You see, I hope before this holy week is over, you will be able to answer for yourself, not for me to tell you why, but you will be able to answer for yourself why it is that this Messiah needs to save you, me, from our sin. Now, when I read the Bible, when I read history, what I see is that over and over and over and over again, left to our own devices, we have the ability to what? Mess it up. Turn this creation that God has given us into a pile of trash. Either as a collective people or our own individual lives. That's the sin. That's the sin that we're talking about. The ability that we have to take this wondrous gift that God has given us and turn it into trash. And then once we find ourselves in that place of trash, to look around and say, well, I guess this is all it is. Yeah, we might as well just kind of keep on keeping on where we are. Never realizing that there is hope over the horizon. That we don't have to live in this trash. And that's the Messiah that we need. The Messiah that's going to lead us to freedom. And so instead of seeing what we want, we need the Messiah that will deliver us. Because left to our own devices, we will wreak havoc. And when you read this lesson this morning from Isaiah, one of the things that, that we see that Jesus is beginning to prepare himself for 
is, is something that's about to happen to him that is one of the worst things that we can do to one another. You know what it is? <coughs> Humiliate one another. I mean, the physical excruciating pain that Jesus is going to go through, that's one thing. But before and through a lot of that, he's going to be humiliated. That's one of the most powerful weapons that we have in our arsenal. That we whip out at a moment's notice and slash and hack each other with it all the time. Don't we? I mean, any time when you hear someone say, oh, there you go again, you're just always like that. You just, you're, you never, da, 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 da. Well, you must be stupid. Those are all forms of humiliation. I've been working with this all week. And yet, yesterday, I'm going through the parking lot, and what do I come upon? I'm coming upon this dad who's standing there trying to get stuff in his car, and all he's standing there doing is humiliating his children. Just humiliating. You want that thing? <coughs> See, I got kind of quiet there for a minute. You know what that feels like, don't you? To be humiliated. It's a very dangerous place. Because one response to feeling humiliated is often to just tuck tail and run, right? I'm out. I don't ever have to say something. What's the other response? Humiliate back. 